Thanks, Paul. Uh, your check is in the mail. I'm going to talk about uh, concussion care and, uh, and tell you the story of how we are trying to reveal this so-called hidden injury um, here, in, here in Qatar. I have no conflict of interest to declare. After this, um, I trust that you will be able to make use of the Aspetar Sport Concussion Program, um, understand the unique challenges in transcultural concussion care, and also apply the principles of shared decision making um, in sport related concussion. I am passionate about concussion care, and I'm not passionate about concussion care because concussion is such an interesting neurological condition to study or something fancy like that. I'm passionate about concussion care because it's done so incredibly poorly. In fact, it is done, it is a, an embarrassment on a regular scale for every single sports medicine physician and team doctor trying to do his job at field side and often in the face of worldwide audiences. Um, it is so bad that it becomes almost a personal insult to me, a personal embarrassment and so should it be to you where we are striving to be world leaders in sports medicine. Concussion is often called the hidden injury um, because it is so often and so easily disregarded or even ignored uh, that, it can, that, that it can actually just disappear right there on field side at, uh, at, at even the highest levels of sport. And I want to show you this. That happened in the previous FIFA World Cup in Brazil. There, the experienced team physician makes a diagnosis of concussion and removes the player from the field. He must have had either healing hands, and this uh, injury was now uh, treated, or it's gone. It's like magic, it disappeared, because this player continued to play uh, the rest of the match. Sometimes um, concussion is also hidden in the scoreline, and this little incident happened in last year's Champions League final to uh, Loris Karius, the uh, goalkeeper of Liverpool, um, where he got a bump to the head um, and subsequently uh, failed uh, to save three goals, and uh, Liverpool lost uh, the championship 3 1 to Real Madrid. So after the fact, he was diagnosed with concussion. Strangely enough, uh, concussion is also hidden in the medical literature. Because in 2001 already, there were more than 25 sport-related concussion severity grading scales available uh, in the literature. And in the 20 years before 2009, there were approximately 20 concussion management guidelines in the literature. So it's clear that we don't know what we are dealing with or how to treat it. So to make sense of this, um, way back in 1999, uh, this review was published to search for a unified definition at least for mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and uh, they came to the conclusion that the hallmark feature for diagnosing a mild traumatic brain injury, which at the time uh, was similar to concussion, are loss of consciousness and post-traumatic amnesia. Um, so this is now the latest um, consensus statement and the best evidence we have uh, for uh, concussion diagnosis and care. Um, given to us by the Concussion in Sport Group, and this one was published in 2017. Now, you will see that they have lowered the bar considerably, because now they propose the diagnostic criteria for concussion as an athlete who has any one 
or more of the following. And they state the initial obvious physical signs such as loss of consciousness and so on. But also vague things like teammates and trainers and coaching staff observing cognitive and behavioral changes such as being easily distracted uh, or answer questions slowly and so on. Um, and then the, if the athlete reports any concussive symptoms, then obviously you must suspect concussion. And then lastly, abnormal neurocognitive and or balance examination by the team doctor. And you'll agree with me that that is incredibly difficult to do at field side or on the field. So it's almost impossible to diagnose concussion uh, in the heat of the moment. Now to try and give a little bit more direction, Paul McCrory and his esteemed group did a review to find out what the lowest threshold is to make a diagnosis of concussion without overdiagnosing. And they introduced their piece by just stating the obvious again. Concussion is considered to be among the most complex injuries in sports medicine to diagnose, assess, and manage. We figured that out. And to make things worse, um, they also state that to make matters more complicated, clinicians often um, face significant pressures to make a rapid assessment right there on the sporting field. Clearly, uh, almost impossible. So why did this happen? Um, in the past, concussion was reckoned to fall within the mild spectrum of mild traumatic uh, brain injury, um, where loss of consciousness and amnesia and so on um, can be found. But we now know that there's a milder form of mild uh, traumatic brain injury which we now call minimal traumatic brain injury. And this thing is very vague and the symptoms are uh, very often subclinical. And that is what makes it so difficult. So what are we doing? We are clearly balancing under diagnosis and over diagnosis of concussion. And we as team physicians and, and sports medicine physicians are always uh, leaning towards the conservative side um, in the interest of patient care and patient safety. Um, so we will most probably uh, overdiagnose uh, concussion in, the re in, in, in real life. That has led to this widely adopted slogan uh, that we use, when in doubt, sit it out. So if we think there might be a concussion, please uh, remove a player from the field. But is this helpful? Because this man there knows that we are guessing. And he has a totally different mindset. He only needs 11 players on the field and he wants to win matches. He doesn't care about subclinical whatever. As a matter of fact, uh, in this picture, he is not shouting instructions to his team uh, uh, of any kind. He is screaming at his uh, very respected team physician while she is busy uh, removing a clearly concussed player from the field. So um, it sits in the mindset. This is Karius again. Uh, he wasn't going to leave the field in the Champions League final. Um, and maybe he should have because here he is uh, crying and begging his fans and his teammates uh, for forgiveness. Uh, it might have been better for his reputation to, to just uh, call it a day clearly difficult concepts. And this is very well summarized in this essay on sociology of sport, ethics, and the law, um, where they point out the role of culture in sport. And we all know this. It's a well-known axiom in professional football that you can't make the club in the tub, which means that perpetually injured players are just not seen um, as reliable enough for, for regular selection on a team, and they, they lose uh, uh, their, their status on the team very easily. They also talk about the putative warrior culture that pervades every aspect of the game of football. Now, granted, they're talking about American football, yeah, but uh, it's safe to say that quite a bit of these uh, principles that they talk about are transferable to any, uh, any type of football. And you will recognize 
this, the imperatives of self-sacrifice and self-denial for the sake of the team, ignoring even intense pain, perhaps inevitably lead players to downplay the insults to the body in order not to be regarded as weak in both body and spirit to teammates and coaches. And then they can be seen as sitting in the tub. Massively important to understand that there's a huge power differential between the coach and the player. The coach is a very powerful person in this system and we might as well acknowledge that there's just as big a power differential between the coach and the team doctor. And the sooner we acknowledge that and deal with it um, and communicate um, in that vertical level with the coach, the better it will be for us for concussion care and otherwise. So this is what's happening. It's easier to uh, shrug off a headache than a wobbly knee, so we're hiding a concussion in the lack of visible signs. Now, all of us have anecdotes or know of anecdotes of people, athletes who were clearly concussed and then uh, went on, got up and scored the winning goal or win a boxing world title or something like that. So is it really so important? Let's look at the literature. Um, now, I know this is, a, this is an old estimation in 2001, but this is the one that's most often quoted to this day, so I'm using it. And this is just to, estim oh, to, to show that we don't really know. They estimated that there are 1.6 to 3.8 million cases per year in, in the United States, but they also estimated that they are underestimating this by 6 to 10 times. So we don't know. And this has been um, um, proven, really, uh, in the publication that, uh, that came out in 2018 from Canada, where they found a 250% increase in the reporting of concussion between two surveys, the first one between 1994 and 99, and the second one between 2000 and, 2000, oh, and, and, and 2018. So this doesn't mean that there's uh, all of a sudden a concussion epidemic in Canada. It just means that, that this hidden injury is becoming more and more revealed as people, the public, the media, become more aware of its consequences. Now, if we look at the consequences, I'm going to start slightly differently uh, than uh, what one would do in a, in a standard medical uh, presentation. And I will start with the performance consequences. Um, this is a study um, that looked at eye tracking velocity error after concussion, uh, where they compared the eye tracking velocity and the, the variability thereof in a group of concussed athletes compared with a normal non-concussed control group. And it's clear to see that the variability is really significantly poorer in the, in the concussed group. Um, and you will agree with me that, that eye tracking ability should be a really important thing to have intact if you want to be uh, an elite level goalkeeper. Um, so a 3-1 scoreline might very well be hidden right there in these results. We also know that um, concussion causes poor balance poor spatial orientation, and it interferes with uh, vision stability, all things that are important uh, in, in playing sport and playing football. Granted, these studies are not done on the field. Uh, these, are, these are laboratory controlled studies, but uh, very difficult to do trials uh, while the match is going on. To bridge the gap between uh, performance-related consequences and the medical risks, this is a very important study uh, published by uh, Professor Jan Ekstrand's group and Professor Anna Nordstrom, uh, where they studied the European elite, uh, elite football leagues for a period of 10 years. And they found that sport-related concussion increases the risk of subsequent injury, any injury, ACLs, hamstrings, whatever, by about 50% in these elite male football players. Now, that raises two very important points. First of all, the obvious one of injury risk, 50% increased injury risk just after having 
had a bump against your head. One should take note of that. But also, the whole risk of player availability. If all of a sudden every single concussed player has an increased risk of losing a few months on, on, a, on a subsequent injury, then it has consequences for player availability and, 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 and squad selection. Let's quickly talk about the medical complications. And the first one that comes to mind is the dreaded second impact syndrome. Now, this is a rare condition. Um, and uh, it's really only reported in case studies. But it happens when a second insult to the brain uh, uh, occurs before the resolution of the first one, uh, leading to severe cerebral edema. And this thing can be fatal. Um, what makes it more important um, to recognize this condition is that children are more prone to getting the second impact syndrome. Now, I'm tempted to relate this rare and fatal condition to a sudden cardiac death uh, on the football field. That's also very rare and it's also fatal, but it gets a lot of traction. Uh, and people are very aware of that where this similarly important condition is, um, is mainly ignored. There are long-term neurocognitive effects such as the post-concussion syndrome or prolonged recovery sometimes for months where people can be stuck with physical symptoms such as chronic, chronic headaches, uh, dizziness and so on. Cognitive things like memory issues, problems with concentration, emotional things like irritability, severe depression, and sleep disturbances, all very debilitating uh, in activities of daily living, but also for sport. This is a problem that's very often disregarded. Academic dysfunction occurs after concussion. And it is every student, every teacher, every parent, has a right to know that a student or a child is not able to study um, optimally and to, to write exams and tests after a concussion for at least a week, up to a month, and sometimes longer. And this is something that we often ignore and, 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 and re uh, requires probably a little bit more attention. This is the elephant in the room. Uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, which, as you know, is an early onset uh, dementia uh, as a consequence of, of repeated uh, head trauma. Uh, here are the PET scans uh, where they compare CTE in the middle there with a normal control and um, somebody with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And you can see it's a clearly different thing. But to go into the details of this is maybe a talk for another day. But safe to say, is concussion really important? I would argue yes. It is particularly important for us here in Qatar um, because when we want to host this little event in 2022, excellent world-class concussion care will not be negotiable. So what is happening uh, in Qatar, and this is a study uh, done by Cristi Cristiano Arale and his group here at Aspeta, where they looked at con concussion surveillance um, in the Qatar Stars League. And what they found um, between 2008 and 2012, only four concussions were reported in the entire uh, Qatar Stars League. Uh, and they recognized that the incidence of this reporting is about 25% of that of comparable uh, leagues in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, so it is very clear that concussion is deeply hidden here in Qatar. So um, when we recognize a problem such as that, that uh, somebody really has to do something about it, and uh, it's almost sad that it had to be me because that uh, left me right in the middle of, uh, of implementation science, uh, which, is a, which is a whole new world out there. It's not just about putting a SCAT-5 out there and telling people to use it. There, there's quite a little bit more involved. 
Um, so Donaldson and Finch um, published a lot on this, and um, in general, they came up with um, with when you want to implement uh, a new program, getting the evidence out to to the field side in the in the clinics. First of all, you need to understand the implementation setting, the context, the culture, and also your capacity in your in your healthcare systems. Then, when you understand the context, you have to find out what is available, and translate what we have into formats that can be accessed and used by our target audience. And only then can you implement your plan. So for me to understand the context uh, and the culture, I also went to uh, the advice of Caroline Finch, and she suggested uh, that one looks at four factors. First of all, the interpersonal factors, sociocultural policies, and the physical environment in which you uh, want to apply your uh, your new uh, uh, program. So I'm going to highlight just a few things here because this is a, this is quite an involved process. But uh, re relating to interpersonal factors, we all know that our athletes, but also our coaches and our healthcare providers, come from all over the world, all from different backgrounds. Um, from different cultures with different languages, and there's a very real risk that there will be misunderstanding and poor communication between these people. Socioculturally, uh, the most important fact for me was to understand that the real decision makers in sport in this country, and also most things in this country, uh, are that we are people from Middle Eastern cultures, of course. Now, Middle Eastern culture are high in context, very high context cultures where there's a very specific hierarchy um, if in the systems. There's a very specific way of consulting and of making a shared decision in, in this high context <coughs> group of people. Um, and very often, the decision making is, uh, is, is with deliberation and is slow. And one needs to understand that, especially for me, having to convey the message. And I had to very quickly understand that I come from a very low context culture where we are very direct in what we say, very direct and very quick in how we make decisions. And clearly my way of communicating will not sit well with the important decision makers in this context. Policies. Of course, we have policies. FIFA, in fact, was one of the uh, founding members of the concussion and sport group to put out the best evidence for concussion care. So clearly, they are concerned about that. Uh, and so does the AFC. But we all know that these policies are not applied and for obvious reasons because we don't know what we are diagnosing and we don't there's just too much guesswork for this to be applied rigorously uh, over a broad spectrum concerning the physical environment um, this was at least a positive for me because all clubs and athletes in uh, in qatar are within one hour's drive from specialized medical care or specialized concussion care. But even more uh, encouraging was that all team doctors and team medical personnel are employed by Aspitas. So this is a really uh, accessible group to uh, start implementing the new program. And I decided to use that as my inroads into concussion care uh, and improving that in, the, in this country. So after after assessing the context, I had to go back to uh, Donaldson and Finch's model and, uh, and found out that I had to put a little bit more detail into this. So first of all, I had to keep determining the status quo, not only the intercultural things, but where the leagues are played, where the camps are, what the decision making is, and so on. Um, then find the most effective methods of knowledge transfer, especially um, as it pertains to, to transcultural communication and how to uh, convey messages uh, in between uh, different cultures. 
and then create a network of uh, early adopters to start uh, implementing something at least. And there, my target group uh, would obviously have been the National Sports Medicine Program. In terms of content, um, uh, we had to customize available tools um, and then create a customized workflow that is uh, that, that works for the healthcare systems available where we are, and a referral system, and after that, adopt a policy. So, you may argue that one should adopt a policy first and then do all of these things, and that is true, except that we are working with high context decision makers, and it is impossible for me to convince such a person or a group of decision makers that they need to adopt something if I haven't shown them that it works and that it is safe and there's value in this before they will make it part of their, uh, part of their life. So we did that last. In fact, we're still in process with that. But the important thing here is all of this is totally dependent on knowledge transfer, on creating awareness and education, or if you want, of revealing the hidden injury. To translate what is already known into formats that can be accessed and used here, um, I went back to the literature and did a search on uh, what neuropsychological tools there are available for Arab populations. And to my horror, we found that the rate of neuropsychology publications from the Arab countries combined, all of them combined, was less than half of that of any of the top 10 American journals. So there's almost nothing. And safe to say that there's absolutely nothing about sport-related concussion. <coughs> so that took me back to the best uh, evidence that I had. We had to go back to the consensus statement of the, of the concussion and sport group. Um, which is built around this document, the SCAT-5, or the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool, um, which we use and which is used internationally um, to recognize and assess concussion. And we made that available to the, to the team doctors, but we soon found that this is not helpful because there are just too many things that was lost between uh, Arab understanding and English understanding, and it was, it was really uh, not helpful. So it came to that that we had to translate this, uh, this quite complicated document and also validate it. Um, and in order to do that, we had to translate first of all, but also culturally adapt. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute and then validate and see if it's working in the field. Uh, now this process um, starts with with the source language, in this, uh, in this case, the English SCAT-5. Um, and that must be translated then into the target language of Arabic uh, by two translators, bilingual translators, then back translated into English. And then the second phase of this is to compare your back translated one to the original document and see where the flaws are. Then by a process of uh, of discussion uh, amongst a group of experts. Uh, they come to a consensus of what the best, uh, most appropriate uh, words and uh, context would be uh, for this new document. And uh, this process carries on until everybody is happy with this. So before I show you these things, I have to acknowledge and congratulate this group of people. Um, the concussion translation and adaptation team of the SCAT-5 um, under the leadership of May Awatani. They did excellent work. This is an example of what they did with the translation of the SCAT-5, and there you can see the first Arabic translation, back translation, what they found lacking, suggested changes, and so on, and this process carried on for months. The second aspect that is really interesting um, is the cultural adaptation, and that was done under the very capable leadership of Sufyan Suisi. Um, the first thing that came to mind is that 
in the concentration test in the SCAT-5, people need to say the months of the year backwards. But it's not appropriate if the people that you are testing use a different type of counting of months. So we had to adapt this, obviously. Second very interesting thing is the memory test, where uh, you cannot just translate the five words that, uh, that people have to memorize to test their memory in the SCAT-5. These words have to be of equally familiar concepts in both languages. They must belong to the same semantic domain, must have the same number of syllables, and so on. Uh, not show any phonological similarities for each series and so on. And for that, Sufyan went and consulted with experts of Qatar University. Um, if that is not enough, we found out that symptom interpretation varies between cultures. For instance, uh, a headache in certain cultures mean uh, marital problems. <laughs> uh, that figures, doesn't it? But also concepts such as pressure in the head and feeling in a fog, which are questions on, on the, on the SCAT-5 uh, symptom uh, assessment, have no meaning for Arab speakers. So we had, to, uh, we had to change that into something understandable. This is a study also done in Canada where they assessed baseline SCAT uh, concussion uh, reporting in non-concussed uh, college athletes and they found significant differences between the reporting of, 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 of symptoms between different cultures. So it became clear that even the interpretation of the symptom score is culture specific and one needs to understand that when you are the interpreter of this. So I'm super excited to tell you that uh, we are in the process of the final validation of the first ever Arabic sport concussion assessment tool. Uh, and soon it will be made available for us to use in our concussion program, but also for the entire uh, Arab speaking uh, sporting uh, community. To build our toolkit, we also uh, uh, did a translation of the concussion recognition tool which is used by uh, non-medical or non-healthcare providers such as coaches and referees. We adopted the CNS Vital Signs uh, computerized neurocognitive tool, an American-based uh, uh, program, uh, because it is available in Arabic. And we designed, in consultation with people, uh, uh, with communication experts, a patient information leaflet uh, to give athletes and their caretakers or caregivers uh, in the first 48 hours after concussion. We made that available in English and Arabic. We also designed a very graphic visual uh, return to play, return to activity and sport protocol to clearly show the stages of uh, gradual return to sport. Uh, not only is that helpful to the, to the team physicians uh, guiding this process, but it's very easy to show an athlete exactly where in the process they are and also to communicate this better to coaches. We made this available, of course, also in English and Arabic. Then we summarized all of this um, on the Aspetar website in the concussion uh, program uh, section of it and made that available in downloadable format for everybody to use. So now, we had the whole uh, toolkit ready and we understand the context and we could start implementing our plan. This is um, the management flowchart of suspected concussion that we designed specifically for Qatar. And that follows the best evidence rules, but the important thing here is we had to take into consideration our very specific uh, 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 environment where we, th this might be the Aspetar sport concussion program, but because of scope of practice, we are not the appropriate, appropriate first referral of any acute concussion. Uh, we can only accept concussion after neurosurgical emergencies have been ruled out. Um, and that had to be built into this program and obviously communicated very well. 
So to apply this plan, uh, we had to build a team, and we did that by a series of workshops uh, between Naspetar, NSMP, Hamad Hospital, and the Qatar Red Crescent. Um, the Red Crescent are, of course, instrumental in, in the success of this because they are very often the first responders at field, field side, but also they have to know exactly where to transport a concussed player and not bring them to me. Um, to assist with education, we, we designed, again, with communication experts, coach and manager information leaflets, and, uh, and we were told that the best way to reach, uh, to reach players in this environment, in this country, is to use uh, short messages on social media. So we em embarked on a social media campaign on Instagram and Twitter with these little messages that we bombarded them with. So there we had it, uh, a comprehensive uh, concussion management program starting with awareness and education. We have a SCAT-5. When an injury happens, we have a whole referral pathway back um, to, uh, to treatment and, uh, and graded return to play. But it didn't work. The team doctors came to me and said, listen, I now know how to recognize a concussion on the field, and I know that I have to remove it from play. But invariably, something happens. First of all, the manager would interfere and wouldn't want his type player to, to, to come off the field, as we know he would now. Secondly, the player wouldn't want to leave the field, as we know they would. When the team doctors wanted to rest and start rehabilitation, the manager and the players would invariably insist on, uh, on early start of retraining, maybe on the next day uh, take, take part in a full training session. And also the players um, refused to be referred um, to the emergency room for CT scanning and, 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 and further assessment. Uh, Maybe because they don't understand the possible consequences, or maybe just because they are too lazy to go sit in a queue um, at night at Hamad Hospital. And then there was also the thorny issue of return to sport, because the match schedule doesn't wait for any injury to, to go away. So these are universal problems. It's not particular to Qatar. And, uh, and that is why this condition is treated so incredibly poorly. It's sitting in this domain. So if we didn't come up with something new, nothing would change. And we went back to the principles of medical ethics uh, and of shared decision making, and we recognized a number of issues that we could work with. First of all, uh, the player refusing to leave the pitch and the player's refusal for ER referral has got to do with patient autonomy. The second issue that we recognized is um, where the manager interferes with everything, the issue of shared decision-making. And then the third thorny issue of the match schedule also remains. So we decided to deal with this um, by using Elwin's three-talk model of shared decision-making, where it starts, the process starts with assembling a team, um, and uh, in this case, in sports medicine usually, the team consists obviously of the athlete and the doctor, but also the coach and maybe a parent and maybe a teacher uh, in the case of, of, of young people. Then the problem needs to be illustrated to them. They need to be educated about what's going on here. And the possible options of how to deal with it must be deliberated and discussed. And after everybody is on the same, has, has been put on the same page, a decision can be made. Um, so, we decided to deal with both of these issues, uh, both patient autonomy uh, and the manager interference with shared decision making. Now, patient autonomy, unfortunately, is only valid for mentally competent persons. So, it's a type of an informed consent. And in concussion, there's doubtful competence after head injury. Granted, a lot of them are quite competent to make decisions, but on the other hand, they are very biased because of uh, contextual things and because of pressure from the coach and so on, and they are unlikely to make uh, the best possible medical decision. So 
we thought that the autonomy must be executed before the incident happens by doing player education, coming to a shared decision uh, about concussion management when it happens, before it happens, and then let this player write and sign a written consent that you allow, uh, they allow you to take them off the field uh, when he gets concussed. To deal with the whole thing of uh, manager interference, um, we suggest the same process of education of the team management. The doctor and the team management come to a shared decision and put a document in place to say this is how we will deal with concussion in this particular team. It would have made things easier if you started organizational level um, where you get the buy-in of the highest decision-making people that you have access to in your club or your federation and so on and come up with a policy because if you can do that then uh, you can use the policy as ammunition to take to the coach it might be easier to convince them uh, if there's a policy in place and with the backing of the coach the athlete is bound to make a better decision we call this the occasion decision in concussion O for organization C for coach and A for athlete um, and for this to work obviously all of this needs to happen before the start of the season uh, we are proud to announce that uh, this plan has just been accepted for publication in the British Journal so we've come up with solutions to most of the problems of manager interference and player uh, refusal and so on and that only left the thorny issue of the match schedule but at least now everybody will know that if you follow an evidence-based return to play protocol which takes more than a week a player is bound to be not available for at least one match so that left us with uh, a more functional aspect of sport concussion program embedded in a multi-level uh, shared decision making process and i want to conclude by sharing with you a few examples from uh, of the Aspetop uh, concussion program in action. This is a patient of uh, Dr. Kamel Ndeep, Agarafa. And you can see that he's clearly concussed. Um, Dr. Kamel uh, treated him according to our guidelines, and uh, I'm happy to announce that he, uh, he, after missing one match, he returned to play. This is a handball player, uh, the patient of Nuruddin Garbi. Uh, I have to just uh, remind you that the patient gave consent for us to show this, this footage for educational purposes. involuntary movements, loss of consciousness, and he was treated in the correct way. Please uh, do not share this on social media because we got a real patient there. So in Hamad emergency room, he didn't know where he was. Severe antro and retrograde amnesia, he had a severe headache. Um, yeah, if you know. yeah. هذه التلفزيون تلفزيون عادي فين ما تشيت البرامج clearly not well so they carried on in stage one of the of the uh, protocol um, with physical and cognitive rest at the at club uh, under the guidance of Dr. Nuruddin uh, and he was taken care of by his teammate who is a friend of the family um, even after a number of days, he still couldn't even remember what the sport was that he played.
انت تلعب كره قدم انا عمر انا عمر هو الدكتور وشيف البرك شيف البرك والدكتور ايش قال لك الرياضه اللي تلعب فيها؟ نلعب كده بتاعي And then he was progressed to symptom limited activity, um, and we did serial uh, scat uh, assessments on him uh, in consultation with Nuruddin, and then used our own protocol to return him to activity and sport. And this was guided by uh, by Mohammed Salim, which I have to acknowledge in this. This was an excellent piece of work. Um, and in addition to the stage of light aerobic exercise in every single stage. He also incorporated rehabilitation of balance and uh, coordination and so on, uh, as you can see here. Um, did balance, balance with perturbations and so on. Uh, went on to, uh, to uh, a little bit more sport specific work with and without the ball. Um, and eventually put him into non-contact training with the team where he was told where he was given a different color shirt so to indicate that he's not allowed to uh, have contact with other players and then <coughs> slow progression to full contact practice his position specific um, in his position as a playmaker <laughs> And he went on to represent Qatar uh, a month or so after that uh, in an international tournament. So the lessons that we learned, first of all, understand the end user's perspective. The whole thing of client-centeredness, you need to earn the credibility of your plan before people will accept it. The second lesson uh, in terms of context is everybody needs to understand the capacity of the local healthcare system, understand that Aspetar can do anything for concussion except except doing neurosurgical uh, uh, management. So it needs to be ruled out first. We learned that translation and cultural adaptation uh, is not a simple process, uh, and it needs to be done right. We also learned that Western education methods are not necessarily transferable into this culture. So in conclusion, um, we found that the implementation of evidence-based guidelines requires extra skills, specialized skills and knowledge. It's absolutely dependent on effective knowledge transfer, in this case, intercultural. Uh, it has to be context conscious. And we've realized that transcultural concussion management is a complicated thing, and we haven't even scratched the surface. So there is a research field for anybody interested in something new. So we are well on our way uh, to reveal uh, this hidden injury of, of, of concussion in Qatar. Uh, I need to acknowledge uh, the team, which did a lot of uh, excellent work, especially Dr. John Patricius, our international consultant. And just to remind you that we now have something to show, but we are far from world class yet, I leave you with uh, a quote from uh, the father of my multicultural rainbow nation, Nelson Mandela. Thank you. <laughs>